Good morning, I'm Pastor Gillespie from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church and School, Sherman Center, Random Lake, Wisconsin. It's good to have you with us here for the Congregation of Prayer, a guide for daily meditation and prayer around God's Word. It's Monday, April 1st, 2024, and uh, we may be fools, but we're fools for Christ, right? So it's not a day to go about uh, lying and cheating and stealing and all the things that fools do on this day. Instead, we follow the wisdom of Christ. All right. Uh, looks like my my light doesn't want to turn on. Hold on. Well, turned on for a moment there, but uh, no such luck. All right. Well, maybe maybe it'll come on later. <laughs> we haven't we haven't. Uh, no, I haven't been in here for how many days? Uh, for a week. Yeah, we met in person. This last week, um, each morning, thanks for coming out, those of you who did, those of you who still watched online, hope that was a blessing to you. Um, it's appropriate to keep um, that week holy, and um, and so we did, by gathering together each day around the Word of God and prayer and the Lord's gift of His Supper. So uh, I, I pray that was a blessing to you. Uh, one of the reasons why we can do that, uh, this is really the festivals of the church, I should say this. The festivals of the church correspond to days that are accounted to uh, precisely in the scriptures. So uh, you might think of some of those festivals. Uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the birth of our Lord, um, the baptism of our Lord, mm, that's eight days after the Epiphany. The Epiphany um, is celebrated on the 6th. Those days don't have precise dating in the scripture. Um uh, Let's see, do we have some that do? Ash Wednesday uh, represents the 40 days in the wilderness, so 40 days before Passover. Uh, Palm Sunday, very precisely defined in the scripture. Each day of Holy Week, very precisely defined. Um, Easter Sunday, also, of course, the day of the resurrection, precisely uh, dated around the Passover. And then, um, uh, actually, Easter Monday, Easter Tuesday, Easter Wednesday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for sure. Monday uh, is really Easter evening, so uh, that would be also precisely defined. So these are considered feast days where we recognize things that happened on the days. 
All right. Um, another one would be Ascension Day, of course, 40 days after um, Easter. And then, of course, uh, 50 days after Pentecost. That is the 50 weeks, or 50 days, I should say. Um, those come after um, Easter. So uh, most of these feast days actually fall on days that are relatively precisely defined. Um, even some of the saints' days as well, of course, uh, are maybe just following tradition, but at least the tradition of the, maybe their death day. All right. Um, so today would be a feast day to the Lord, um, if that were our tradition. Uh, one of our older members uh, mentioned to me mm, last week that he remembers his congregation, uh, and a, a different congregation when he was young, uh, gathering on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Easter week, the ladies walking to church. You could see them walking to church. So um, maybe someday we'll we'll gather in person for these days as well. But uh, um, I'm I'm patient and also incremental, <laughs> you know, as to uh, traditions. All right. So even if we're going to restore an older tradition, we might have to be patient in doing so. Right, uh, as people get used to it. So it's good to have you all here with us today on this Easter Monday. That was a long introduction. All right. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our propers this week will follow uh, the propers for the Easter sunrise service, or Easter dawn. Uh, we don't have a sunrise service here at this point. Be something I'd like to to see it's uh, restored if we could. Um, then the Easter vigil actually could be a little bit more brief. We could end without the sacrament because we'd be gathering in the morning for the sacrament. Uh, so maybe that's something uh, you'd be willing to consider doing in years to come. Uh, so we'll be using its propers this week for our prayers each day. And the psalm appointed for Easter dawn is Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, indeed I have a beautiful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7b and through 8. Uh, of course, now, if you were with us yesterday, you heard a sermon on this text. I don't usually preach on the epistle, but um, I thought it would be a helpful um, scripture to highlight a few th questions that have come up here uh, recently, and also for some encouragement and direction as, um, well, what does it mean to put away the old leaven? or as I translated it yesterday, the old sourdough. Um, that's from the uh, the Anglo-Saxon. My friend Donovan riley has been reading this. The Anglo-Saxons uh, call it uh, sour bread or sourdough and uh, stiff dough. So the unleavened is the stiff dough, right? Uh, but sour and stiff, that those are um, 
those are helpful adjectives, aren't they? Um, malice and wickedness is sour. It's it's just, it's bitter. It's it's not tasting good. And then uh, stiff, you know, resolved, um, firm, confident is that unleavened bread. In any case, uh, yeah, you have a sermon on that. You can go uh, listen or watch that. It's available on all the platforms. All right, so go do that. And hopefully that was edifying for you as well. And our catechism for the week, our confession, will be from the explanation to the second article of the Creed. Uh, we already said the Creed, so let's say the explanation. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. Lives and reigns to all eternity. Uh, how about that? Hmm. So the uh, epistle today is from 1 Peter chapter 1. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, and having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever because all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. All right. So um, many of the themes that we uh, heard yesterday and that we'll continue to hear throughout this Easter tide or the season of Easter. By the way, it is a season. It's not just a day, which is why Easter Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are appropriate to keep. Of course, it'll be the Sundays of Easter, not Sundays in Easter. So uh, each Sunday will continue the, the Easter celebration. Um, so uh, you can expect more, more festival-like um, liturgy here for the next seven weeks. All right. Um, so we note uh, the corruptible things. So again, we have leaven, and unleavened, corruptible, incorruptible. You heard that in the sermon yesterday. You hear Luther's reference, or where Luther gets his reference here in the uh, small catechism, that he redeemed me not with gold or silver, right? You saw that here? Not with gold or silver. Well, that comes up. To, uh, he just pulls that right out of First Peter, where he says that you redeemed like, um, not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, right? As he set up here, with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. So Luther, in his second article um, explanation, he's drawing right on uh, 1 Peter here, 1 Peter 1. Okay. Um, notice too about aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, that that does not redeem you either, right? So you're not redeemed by simply um, just going through the motions, so to speak. Uh, you heard um, a sermon about this on uh, Holy Saturday evening, right at the Easter Vigil, uh, where I spoke of keeping watch or staying awake um, or uh, keeping vigil as being uh, an apostolic tradition, one that was received by the early church and that is continued by us. It is appropriate for us to gather together on the eve of Christmas or um, at the vigil of Easter, right, on the Saturday. Um, and also, actually, our hymnal appoints for us to do the same at the eve of Pentecost, as we wait and watch for the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? Which I also mentioned in the sermon on Saturday. So uh, that's not an aimless conduct. Um, that is a received tradition from the fathers, but it's not aimless. It has the goal of waiting and watching 
for the gifts that the Lord promises, his incarnation, his resurrection, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Right? So if uh, someday, maybe, right, we'll restore that tradition as well, as to uh, which was received from the apostles of waiting and watching for the Spirit. Right? That's Acts chapter 1, by the way. So uh, um, it's always a, a little bit of a tension with uh, pastors, uh, for us pastors, I suppose, in, uh, in introducing things. Uh, on the one hand, we want to encourage you to ask for that which the church um, can offer, right? So I say, let's have a, an Easter dawn service. Um, and in, in one sense, I'm, I'm waiting <laughs> patiently for, for folks to say, Pastor, it's finally time. Let's have that Easter sunrise service that you've talked about, right? Um, on the other hand, pastors could just say, we're just going to do it. And um, uh, then you don't really get the same... What's the word? It's going to sound kind of um, callous, maybe. The same buy-in, right? <laughs> the same commitment to it. Um, we want people to receive things um, not out of obligation or duty or because pastor uh, demanded it, um, but rather because um, they desire to receive the sacrament and observe um, the days that that the apostles observe, right? So um, the vigil is one of those sorts of cases. And then um, I suppose these uh, the sunrise and these other occasional days are the same. In any case, um, we don't do it um, with aimless conduct just because we have to, but rather so that we receive Christ for the forgiveness of sins, you see? Um, note here, Peter also speaks of Christ in the same kind of grand cosmology um, that we see what well, we will see in our study of colossians you have it here too he was foreordained before the foundation of the world right to be the lamb who would suffer for sins this is i mentioned this in the sermon one of the sermons i think maybe on friday that uh, this is why god could promise the seed that would crush the serpent's head because it had already been decided from before even the world was made that the son would come to crush the serpent's head all right which is a kind of heady idea, I suppose, but it, uh, a beautiful one too. All right. And then again, if uh, we have received Christ, or because we have received Christ, not uh, in aimless conduct, but rather in his blood, his shed blood, I would say uh, in our baptism in the sacrament, um, then we have been born again. So this was the sermon yesterday, right? That we were raised to new life, that you would not leave, you cannot leave Easter um, or the resurrection of our Lord, the festival the same as you came, right? Because the word of God does what it says. So it forgives sins. It raises to new life. It puts to death the old Adam or it casts out the old leaven if you want to use the, uh, the epistle language, right? And so uh, now there is love for one another. Now there is uh, the joy of the resurrection. Now there is the confidence of, of um, Christ. Christ shed blood, all right? And that all comes by the word of God that endures forever that was preached to you. Hmm. Really a lovely epistle, right? I think one of my favorite stories of the Bible, and this is, um, this is a terrific text for, um, um, I think I, maybe even for a funeral. Oh, that might be an, a good a text for you to choose for a funeral, right? Because we're coming out of the funeral here, <laughs> if you like. Um, this is Easter evening. You'll see that here referenced, okay? So first, uh, read it, and then we'll have a conversation about it. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day, that is the day of the resurrection, to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of the, all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed in reason that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one of those named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the day, the third day, since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. 
When they did not find his body, they came, saying that the, they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose, or so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with him gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Hmm. All right, so the famous account of the road to Emmaus. Um, catechesis is what we do here. So uh, ask questions and uh, seek answers. And uh, that can be done at varying uh, levels of intensity, we might say. All right, so when uh, we do that with the children, we go through basic details, like where are they walking? How far was it? Um, what were they talking about? Et cetera. Um, but uh, there are similar resources actually written for pastors. These are usually called postals. Um, sometimes they are in also question and answer form. Uh, one such great text translated by uh, Matthew Carver, is this book, The Christian Year of Grace. Um, this was a uh, 16th century, uh, one of uh, Luther and Melanchthon's students, actually, a pastor named Johann Spangenberg. And uh, he does this for every day of the church year, if you're on uh, our lectionary. So that's why it's also very helpful uh, for us to use the, the older lectionary. Uh, there's many more resources available to us, classic resources there. Um, but in any case, um, he does the same. He asks questions, uh, but these are for pastors to prepare to preach, all right? So they might be a little bit um, higher level questions. So we're, we'll look at some of these today and we'll see what you think. All right. So the first question he asks is, how many times did Christ reveal himself on the day of the resurrection? It's a good thing for pastors to remember, and I suppose for all Christians. All right. So we heard some of these. Uh, our gospel text yesterday, um, Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene. That was in uh, Mark 16. You uh, may have, you may hear, let's see, it would have been last year, if you're on the three-year series, you would hear him appearing um, to all the women in Matthew 28. Um, he appears to Peter as well, at the outside the tomb, right? And then to, uh, this is all in Luke, and then his two disciples on the way in uh, Luke 24. And then we'll hear next Sunday for our gospel text, um, Luke 24, where he appears to the 11 in the upper room um, in the evening as well. So, uh, wait a minute, he appears to the, yes, he appears to multiple people at the same time in different places. <laughs> um, that's a total, by the way, of five times. So on Easter appeared um, five different times um, and to different people in different places, all right? Uh, now, some would say, well, that's a, a lack of harmony be between the accounts, and so they're clearly mistaken, uh, except this is Christ in his, resur in, in his resurrection and his glorification, um, so even then, as we confess, there's a communication of the divine to the, to the human where Christ can appear in his body um, and yet uh, in multiple places, right? Or even through closed doors and that sort of thing. All right. Um, so why did, why did Jesus reveal himself to the two uh, disciples? What do you think? This would be an interesting question, right? It's not necessarily explicit here, um, but we, I think from the narration, from the story, we can tell. And this Spangenberg suggests um, one to show that there's that that he takes great pleasure in godly conversation. So he likes having this kind of dialogue with us, this catechetical uh, or, or rabbinical or even um, Socratic kind of dialogue. Like, what's going on? What happened? Right? What happened in um, in Jerusalem? Right now, he knows, of course, because it happened to him. Right? Um, but what does he say? What kind of conversation is it that you have had with one another? What things happened? Right? Um, 
What he promised before Matthew 18 is that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And he does this. It's exactly here. We have two gathered in his name, and then he shows up in the midst of them. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So I'd like that connection Spongebob makes. Um, now, he asks the question, why did Jesus reveal himself as a visitor, initially anyway? Mm -hmm. So, um, this is his answer, and we'll see what you think of this. As he was in their hearts, so did he appear to them, asking what they talked with each other about, desiring thereby to draw out their unbelief. We see this Jesus doing this all the time, drawing out unbelief uh, that he might cause to reprove them and then instruct them for faith. So Cleopas says to you, says to him, um, are you alone among the visitors in Jerusalem who do not know these things? And he said to them, what things? They said to him, all right, so he recounts the whole situation. All right. So here they bring their unbelief to light. To light. They speak their mind and talk about Christ in so as to suggest that they had already given up on his pledge, calling him a prophet and yet the, not the man whom they had hoped would reestablish the kingdom of Israel. So they're confessing. He has them they ask these questions, actually, that they would confess their unbelief, right? And then he answers, oh, foolish ones, right? Hey, there you go, April Fool's Day. They're foolish, why? Because they're slow of heart to believe everything the prophets have spoken. Um, this rebuking of his disciples as fools is not an example of wrath, but rather divine zeal. You know, he wants faith, so he's going to work faith here. In this way, he wished to lead them to the knowledge of their sin and unbelief so that they might then become better acquainted with him. Was it not necessary? In other words, it was all ordained by God and foretold by the prophets that it would happen this way. And then he begins to expound for Moses and the prophets from the scriptures, uh, which were spoken of him, namely how the Christ had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, how he would be born a man, that he would be crucified, died, and be buried, and rise from the dead. And he expounded these things in the clearest way. All right? And he can do so. He's got a seven-mile walk, right? So plenty of time to do that. Right. I think I quoted this. Did I quote this text again on Saturday? I think I might have. <laughs> All of Easter kind of blurs together, right? Um, that, that Jesus reveals himself to us in the clearest way from the scriptures. Oh, no, it was actually one of the Good Friday sermons, wasn't it? Fulfilled all the scriptures. Hmm, I don't remember which one it was. You have to go back and listen. All right. How did the disciples respond to the preaching? He acted as if he would keep going on. They still only see him as a visitor, um, but but they implore him to stay with us, right? Abide with me, fast falls the even tide, uh, the darkest deepens. Lord, with with me abide, right? There was still a spark burning and glimmering in their hearts and calling out with inexpressible sighs. Oh, if only Christ were alive! Oh, if only this what this pilgrim said was true! Oh, how eager our hearts are to hear that! You must come with us and tell us more of this dear Christ. <laughs> and so he went in to stay with them. You can hear Spangenberg actually mimicking his teacher, Luther, because Luther would do that. He would take, he would quote the scripture and then just expand it. It is as if he said, right? And it's just beautiful. Just stay with us. Keep telling us more of this about this Christ, about how Christ had promised. And then notice when he sits at the table, what happens, right? Um, as he took the bread, blessed and broke it. Hmm, heard that before. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Um... Oh, then he has, uh, Spangenberg has a dig against uh, the papacy. So, <laughs> again, a student of Luther and also of context, right? Um, I guess they use this as some example that lay people can distribute the sacrament. I don't know. Um, but here, um, Christ rewards them masterfully. For behold, the eyes of the dear disciples were opened and they recognized Christ in the breaking of the bread. Whereas the, those masks of the Pope are only rendered blind and hardened. <laughs> so it will be for all the enemies of the truth. Though having having eyes, they will be blinded. Having open ears, they will be deafened. Though having understanding hearts, they will understand nothing unless Christ himself opens them. Right? Notice what they do after, right? So Spangenberg asks, what did the disciples do after recognizing Christ? Um, here we see this Holy Scripture's ability to take the hearers who are weak in faith, cold in love, and faint in hope, and then miraculously Strengthen, warm, and comfort them, right? So the scriptures miraculously strengthen, warm, and comfort uh, unbelieving hearts. Right. Again, uh, it's, it is maybe a little bit strange that the pastor could assert that 
like I did yesterday, that you would leave changed. But God's word does what it says. All right, so I can make that assertion uh, with confidence, knowing that he will accomplish what he promises. So it is the nature and characteristic of God's word to strengthen weary, faint hearts and consciences and comfort sad, sorrowful hearts and kindle them in faith, love, and hope so that they cannot be silent but must tell all the world of the benefits of God that have come to them. These disciples did the same. Before this, they had left Jerusalem and did not know where to stay for fear. And now, having seen and recognized Christ alive again, they took courage once more, rose the same hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together and said to them who were with them, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told them of what happened and how he was known. All right? And then what Spangenberg does, um, he does this in most of these uh, little apostles that he's drafted. Um, he will have a statement. Yeah, he does in the next sermon too. Well, maybe we'll share that tomorrow. What does Christ mean by these words? Or what should we learn from this gospel? So uh, this, this is sometimes the genesis of a sermon, you know, for someone um, who is studying these, like myself, right? And say, ah, there's, an, there's a good idea. Let's expand upon that. So he sa- suggests that we should learn from this reading, this account, that, that if we look merely at present troubles here on earth, and not at God's word and pledge, we fare no better than these two disciples. We flee and try to escape the cross until Christ comes along and chastises our foolishness. But when the preaching of the gospel reappears, our heart is kindled and burns fervently for the exposition of the scripture. And then we recognize Christ as he breaks and lays before us as the divine word. Thus, when our heart is kindled in faith, such faith will blossom and bring forth the good fruits of faith, that is, true works of love and mercy and will serve Christ and his members, the poor, miserable, sick men, not merely inviting, but actually compelling them into our homes, as these disciples did. Then a thorough understanding of Holy Scripture and genuine faith in Christ follow. Now then, if a Christian has come to faith and recognized Christ through God's word to such a degree, he should share this treasure with everyone, and insofar as he is able, help bring all men to righteousness and blessedness. This is the will and command of God. Right, which I suggested the same to you yesterday in the sermon. I hadn't read this ahead of time, but there it is. All right, um, that you begin to, now, you will begin to see everyone and everything um, through, well, through Christ and Him crucified as sinners for whom Jesus died. How could you not not only invite but compel them to come with you um, into the house of the Lord uh, to be forgiven and to receive the same life you've received? Right? And so you'll note how the Word is what gives uh, these two disciples courage. Um, to go and speak again, right? Um, and so we can ask God to give us that same courage, right? To speak the truth in love, that is to proclaim Christ for the forgiveness of sins to our neighbors uh, without fear of uh, how they might receive it. <laughs> All right. This is one of the things I think we can learn from the uh, early church fathers. Some of our other uh, Christian brethren is a, is actually a fearlessness. Uh, we can fear God, right? Um, in both both, of course, his wrath against sin, but but especially for um, his forgiveness and for what he has done for us in Christ. Right. So it's a godly kind of fear. Uh, we need not fear uh, this world or our own flesh or even the devil himself or the demons, um, because they cannot stand under Christ's word. Good. Um, the hymn of the of the day, or I should say, the hymn of the morning for Easter sunrise is "Awake My Heart with Gladness." This was uh, I had it set as a distribution hymn, the last, and we didn't get to it, um, but we'll get to sing it here all week. So let's sing a few stanzas of the hymn. Savior there was laid 
where our bed must be made, when to the realms of light our spirit wings its flight. The foe in triumph shouted when Christ lay here in the tomb, but lo, he now is routed. His boast is turned to gloom, for Christ again is free in glorious victory. He who is strong come to save has triumphed for the grave. Might take it take a few days for my voice to recover. Uh, also, I uh, broke some of my dietary restrictions <laughs> for Easter feasting, so uh, my throat isn't doing so hot. All right. What a lovely hymn, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think I have it appointed later in the week, so or later in the season. So we'll get to sing it in church as well. Wasn't it lovely to have an organist yesterday um, who's uh, uh, quite gifted, I think, and uh, did a lovely job for us. So give thanks to God for that, too. All right. Uh, today is Easter Monday. Let me get the collect for the day as well, and then we'll pray the collect for sunrise, too. All right, here we go. Let us pray. O God, in this Paschal feast, you restore all creation. Continue to send your heavenly gifts upon your people that they may walk in perfect freedom and receive eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray this day for faith to live in the promises of holy baptism, for all vocations and daily work, for the unemployed, for the salvation and well-being of our neighbors, for our schools, our homeschools, our colleges and seminaries, and for good government and peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Ah, we pray with Bobby and Amy, who celebrated yesterday their, their baptism birthday. Pray for the households of our church, especially this week with Gary and Barb, Jim Schmidt, Paul, Deb, uh, Robert, and Renata. We pray for our catechumens, Wyatt, James, Aaliyah, Cole, Lydia, Charlie, Kaylee, Kimberly, Michaela, and Justin. Pray for all those ill receiving treatment or recovering, especially Ralph, Allison, Maria, Joe, Dennis, Brad and Billy Joe, Harriet, Ron, and the rest of the Yench family that are ill, Carol, Mike, Doug, Courtney, um, Ruth McKenna, who um, had, was hospitalized last week, um, but is home recovering, uh, Renata and Joan, both in rehab, Sandy, BJ, President Willie, and also Phil. I pray for our homebound, Dan, Lenore, Joan, Paul, Dolores, and Pauline. Pray for the missions and mercy work of the church, especially that of Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Continue to pray for um, new enrollments for our day school, that God would grant us growth there. And we continue to pray with the family and friends of Merlin who grieve his death. For all this, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. 
Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. That's our congregation of prayer for today, uh, the the feast of actually Easter Monday. And again, maybe uh, someday you might uh, gather two or three friends together and we can uh, gather together around um, the supper actually too as well on this day. Um, so tomorrow will be Easter Tuesday and then Wednesday will be Easter Wednesday. We will have divine service East, uh, Easter Wednesday evening. So join us for that. That'll be at uh, um, 6.30, our normal Wednesday evening service time. All right. And uh, you're welcome for the live stream for unfortunately disincarnate it was nice to be with you in person last week uh, those of you who could come out but uh, um, i understand well we can use the technology here um, to communicate right um, of course there's the question uh, as to how effective it can be if we're not uh, to gather gather together in our body but in any case all right um, so we'll continue to share god's word with you here uh, tomorrow so i hope to see you then god be with you all We thank you for listening to this podcast from St. John Evangelical Lutheran Church Sermon Center in Random Lake, Wisconsin. If this podcast is of benefit to you, please consider supporting the work of St. John by visiting stjohnrandomlake.org, that's stjohnrandomlake.org, slash support, and give today.